If you're with us for the first time, we're continuing our walk through the Gospel of John. We've entitled our message this morning, The Light That Guides and the Light That Blinds. As you see from John's Gospel, Jesus is clearly the light of the world, the light that gives life. But how you respond to light is a game changer. We live in a world that's been overcome by moral darkness, where people have gotten so used to living in darkness that they reject the light when it's offered. You ever had that experience? You're, you're in a dark room, and you stay in there long enough, and you, your eyes start to adjust, and you eventually sometimes get to see shapes and, and things. It did not get any brighter in there. You just adjusted to being in the dark. And some of you have been living in the dark for so long, you've adjusted to it, but you're really not living in the light that God wants you to have. And and so we're going to talk today about, does your life give evidence of really living in the light? Or are you still stumbling into sin because you don't see where you're going? I have to do a quick disclaimer. Some of you, depending on what translation you have in front of you, your your Bible actually doesn't have the first part of our sermon today, the verses from John chapter 7, verse 53, going to chapter 8, verse 11. Um, just, Just for the record, you know the original autographs of Scripture, supernaturally, divinely inspired, and errant without error. And we have more handwritten copies of scripture than any other document on the face of the earth. Thousands and thousands and thousands of copies of the scripture. People meticulously hand copied the Bible in the early centuries before we had all these conveniences like digital printing. But if I were to ask every one of you to go home and write out every word in your Bible, I promise you, when you came back, some of you would have missed a word here and there. And so it would take a comparison of all of the scriptures that were copied by all, to see which ones were actually most accurate, humanly speaking. Above and beyond all that, we know God superintended his word and the writers of his word to make sure we would not be missing anything we need to have. And and so some of your translations say, well, the copies we use didn't have this section here. But obviously, if you go back, you see this story was circulated from the beginning. And as you read it, you see this story shows Jesus at work. It's very consistent with all that he did everywhere else in his life. But that's why some of your Bibles don't have these verses about the woman caught in adultery. But it's my heartfelt conviction that God wanted it right here, and that's why we have it in this translation. Okay? It is so consistent with how he forgave people like us caught in sin. And before we start talking about this poor woman who's being shamed in front of the crowd about her sin, point number one, every one of us been caught. (laughs) Every one of us been caught in the act of sin by the eyes of a holy God, okay? The question is, how are you responding? So the word of God says, as Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, remember last week after the end of chapter seven, everybody else went to their home, Jesus had to go Sleep on the Mount of Olives. But the next morning, he goes again to the temple. and all the people came to him, he sat down and taught to them. Then the scribes and Pharisees, the scribes were these people who hand copied scripture. The scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear them. Let me pause there for a second. All of us, 
You know that feeling of having been caught doing something we had no business doing. So some of you have heard this story a lot of times. I want you to put yourself in the circle today. What did it feel like when you got caught? Maybe not by family and friends, but you know God convicted you of the sin you had committed. Maybe you were exposed. Uh, what, what did it feel like when all eyes were on you and your sin? Don't we all have those moments where all of a sudden, out of nowhere, something you did 20 years ago just pops back in your mind. You feel horrible. You feel ashamed. And then if others found out about it, they, you know, people have this way of making you feel even worse than you already did. <clears throat> well, that's what this woman is feeling. She's in front of a crowd of people, completely embarrassed because she's been caught in the act of sexual sin. Most people who participate seem to think they're never going to get caught. Uh, give King David a call when you get a moment. <laughs> he thought he had covered his tracks and people all around the world still thousands of years later reading about what he thought he wasn't going to get caught doing. <laughs> oh, by the way, uh, sexual sins were among those listed by God as worthy of capital punishment. Now that seems harsh in our permissive <laughs> Society. Many have no idea why God included safeguards and boundaries to something he created for us to enjoy. In case you didn't know, um, God intended for sexual activity to involve your body, soul, and spirit. And he wanted you to engage when you were in a relationship a marriage because by his design, what you were doing was not just a few moments of pleasure, but you were, he was allowing you to be part of his intended creation process that out of what you were doing together as you unite yourself, body, soul, and spirit, a life could be formed that would live forever. So it wasn't something to be entered into thoughtlessly. It was something he intended for a process of bonding together and being allowed to participate in what God can only do, and that's to create. And so naturally, Satan comes along and says, oh, no, go for it. It's just, it's just to make your body feel good. And it's over when it's over, and you'll never you know, move on to the next hamburger. Um, <laughs> doesn't work like that. <clears throat> That's why when you read the Old Testament, it was literally a capital offense to have sex outside of the covenant of marriage. That is serious. And although the law doesn't apply to us in the same way, the consequences don't change. God still cares. He still says within the confines of marriage... But they caught this woman. They said they caught her in the act of adultery. And they wanted to trap Jesus, it says. He, okay, you say you are from the Father and, and, and the word comes through you. Well, the word says that anyone caught in the act of adultery should be stoned to death. What do you say? Look, let her be. Jews were looking to trap Jesus in situations where he may be charged with disregarding the law of Moses. Oh, by the way, Christ authored the law of Moses because he's God. <laughs> You're going to argue with somebody who wrote the book trying to tell them what the book says. <laughs> yes, scripture mandated that the adulterer and the adulteress should be executed. But as you've heard me say a hundred times, if they caught her in the act, they knew who the dude was. <laughs> Excuse my English, but where he at? <laughs> they didn't care about the law. They were trying to put Jesus 
on the spot. And in case you didn't notice, the, the Jews were an enslaved people, so even though their scripture said capital punishment for certain sins, the, the Romans wouldn't let them do that. Not out of compassion, but they didn't want their workforce killing each other off. That's why when they put Jesus on trial, they had to go to the Roman authorities after they convicted him religiously. They had to go convict him politically so that the execution could be carried out. Okay? Now, every once in a while, they went on and did it anyway. You notice that they did stone Stephen. But again, these religious leaders want to trap Jesus. We caught her in the act. Law says, killer, what do you say? It, it was interesting. They, there were times where actually this did happen, especially in the Older Testament. I, I saw in one of my history books that, excuse me for being graphic, but this is actually what it said, that they would put the man standing knee-deep in manure and have two individuals tie something around his neck and walk off in different directions to strangulate him. For having committed adultery. So, so how do we get from capital punishment for sexual sin to it doesn't matter? Well, it does matter to God. And he put boundaries to protect you. Because he didn't want you to get hurt from people taking advantage of you who aren't committed to you or committed to him. So we're the woman in the circle, caught in our sin. What's Jesus going to do? Interesting, when you look at verse 6. While they're still saying, the law says kill her, what are you going to do? It says kill her. So he stoops down and starts to write something. Now curious minds want to know what he wrote. Isn't it interesting that we have absolutely no record of anything Jesus ever wrote down? Personally, I, I would love to see his journal. <laughs> we have no record of what he wrote down, but he wrote something here. They kept asking him in verse 7, and he suddenly stood up and said to them, He who was out sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. What I found out for the first time, the letter C. The word used for Jesus writing something down is the word they would use when someone is writing a record of something. Catch that? He wasn't just writing. He was writing a record of something. And so that's why we conclude that he was probably documenting some of the sins that these brothers standing around him had done. Because you, you notice after he said, he who uh, hasn't committed a sin, why don't you start the rock party? And he started writing again. And then verse 9 says, those who heard it, suddenly being convicted in their own conscience, started leaving. Um, you know, I've got to pick up my son from basketball practice. I've got to go. <laughs> uh, my wife called me. got to go. They all started to leave after Jesus started writing. And suddenly, it was just the woman and Jesus. See, after everybody else has accused you of what they, what you've done, you, you kind of feel good when the Lord starts reminding your accusers uh, that they aren't sinless either. <laughs> but eventually, we're all alone in front of the Lord. Now what? Jesus said, verse 10, where, where are your accusers? Does anybody condemn you? She said in verse 11, no one, Lord. Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go, sin no more. Look at letter D, section 1. The adulterous woman knew. She was being offered grace when she deserved judgment. See, the only one who really had a right to accuse her was offering her forgiveness. The one who 
had the right to condemn her and judge her and have her killed, actually was there to offer her forgiveness. Isn't that good to know? As I said earlier, we've all been caught in our sin. She looked at him and said, no one, Lord. Now, now sometimes the word Lord in the Bible simply means sir, a term of respect. But, but sometimes they're acknowledging that you are my Lord. Yes. Yes. I just want to believe that as, as she saw that the Lord was offering her forgiveness when she deserved judgment, she was acknowledging that he is Lord. And when you acknowledge that he is Lord, you can receive forgiveness if you've repented of your sin because he loves to do that. Now, oh, by the way, you do notice he said uh, at the end of verse 11, I'm, I'm not going to condemn you, but stop doing what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. See, grace does not give us a license to keep on sinning. Absolutely. Thank God we've been forgiven, but he's saying stop that behavior. I had to die for that. Yeah, I'll forgive you, but stop doing it. Okay? I keep thinking about this. I always felt horrible when I was caught having done something I knew I had no business doing. And, and you see the eyes of the Lord shining on you and you, you feel unworthy to even look at yourself in the mirror or look at him and you, you see this smile on his face. I hope you learned your lesson. Stop doing that. My blood will cover that sin, but don't go there again. See, see, folks that have been forgiven have something to sing about. You know? See, some, some people come to church and they, they wonder why other people are singing with joy. But when you know that you know that you know that everything you've ever done has been washed away, you sing some praise. <clears throat> She received forgiveness, and she knew she should have been condemned. And if you're a child of God, you should have those same feelings today. Let's move on. John chapter 8, start at verse 12. The word of God says, then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Pharisees therefore said to him, you bear witness of yourself. Your witness isn't true. Jesus answered and said to them, even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true. I know where I came from and where I'm going. You don't know where I come from and where I'm going. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one, and yet if I do judge, my judgment is true, for I'm not alone. I'm with the Father who sent me. It's also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am one who bears witness of myself. And the Father who sent me bears witness of me. Then they said to them, where is your father? I, I, I have to pause there. Okay. You know, let me work my way back to that. Okay. First of all, if you're a follower of Christ, you're going to receive the light you need to guide you wherever God wants to take you. So Jesus says, I'm the light of the world. Light's difficult to explain in terms of origin and what it actually is. It's, it's kind of easier to explain what light does than what it is. God said, I am light. He is light. He's pure brightness. He illuminates. He, he guides with that light to, the Lord is my light and my salvation, the psalmist said in Psalm 27. Whom shall I fear? Light. We've discovered that light travels at a speed of over 186,000 miles per second, and it never varies. Never varies. 
God identifies himself as light throughout the Old Testament, and then Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Interesting. Did you notice that Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6, that that same God who commanded light to shine out of darkness has shined his light in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Just like he did in the beginning when he said, light be and light was, there was a moment in time in, in your life, if you were a believer, that you were living in moral darkness. And at one moment in time, the Holy Spirit spoke and you went from darkness to being in the light. And it can happen the moment you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and Jesus says, I am that light because I'm God. And the Pharisees start clapping back at him, saying, ah, you bearing witness to yourself. You, that ain't, that's not true. And, and Jesus explained, well, hey, I, I can go there. Uh, but oh, by the way, my father also bears witness of everything I'm saying. And then this sarcasm comes out in verse 19. Uh, where is your father? See, they're going back to this story that they didn't want to believe about this supernatural incarnation and, and basically saying, you don't even know who your daddy is. We never did believe that story. <clears throat> Isn't it amazing how gracious God is? Folks insult he who could snatch his air out of your lungs yes. at any second. <laughs> he who started your heart beating can stop your heart at any second. And he lets you actually insult him and let you keep breathing his air, enjoying his sunshine right. on right. his earth. Oh, that's amazing grace. Because... <laughs> So y'all know y'all would have slapped somebody. And, <laughs> and God is still extending forgiveness to sinners. <laughs> where, where is your father? We ain't seen your father in 30 years. We're talking about your father. Verse 19, Jesus answered, you neither know me nor my father. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. He spoke these words in the treasury, verse 20, as he taught in the temple. No one laid hands on him, for his hour had not yet come. Quick word about the, the treasury, the temple. I, I meant to bring up an image of this, this huge building, this temple, and it had different sections. You may have seen that they... The Jews had a court of the Gentiles. The Gentiles could come in and worship to some degree, but there were places they couldn't go past. They'd actually written on the walls, if you pass this boundary, you will be killed. You're talking about racism and prejudice. and You're going to worship God. And the people who are the guardians of the truth... Say, so, okay, you can come here, but if you come here, we're going to kill you right. in the name of the Lord. Mm. And they, they also had a court of the women. You know, the women could come so far but not have full access. Right. All this in the temple. But interesting, they, they said Jesus is in the, the, the treasury area. And they, they had, a, I believe they told us there were, like thir there were 13 different trumpet-shaped openings where you come in and you put... You're offering for this here, and you're offering for this over here. And, you know, different places were set apart for different kinds of, of offerings. And so there's a mob of people there in that area, and this is where Jesus is choosing to teach. And it's here where he's going to point out himself, letter B, as 
the real light of the world. They, they had the celebration where they, the priests would crawl up and, and put the oil and light these candelabra. And it, they said the light was so bright from these four particular pillars that the whole city would see this light. And Jesus is strategically using opportunity to say, I'm the real light of the world. And he's telling these, these, these men that if you know me, you would have known my father also. Now, on a practical level, I know some of you, and I've, I've never met your father. So if Jesus can say, if you know me, you know the father. If you've seen me, you've seen the father. You don't say that unless you are co-eternal, co-equal with the father. He's the perfect example of the phrase, like father, like son. <laughs> and he could bear witness of himself being genuine and being the righteous judge, just like the father. In verse 21, Jesus said to them again, I'm going away. You will seek me and will die in your sin. Because where I go... You cannot come. So the Jews said, will he kill himself? Because he says, where I go, you cannot come. Interesting tidbit. This is arrogance and religious, I hate to say the word stupidity, but it's just the first one that's coming to my mind <laughs> on display. Because when he said, I'm going to go somewhere that you can't come, what they thought was, he's going to commit, that's what, no, is he going to kill himself? See, they felt that if you committed suicide, you were automatically going to hell. And in their minds, that was the only place you going to go that we can't go because we're not going to hell. Right, right, right. Did you catch that? That's why, they say, is he going to kill himself? Talking about he going somewhere we can't go. Isn't it amazing that they're talking to the author of life and wondering if he about to go to hell. They're the ones with ticket in hand. This is an interesting back and forth that starts taking place here. Notice... Those who said in verse 23, uh, you're from beneath, I'm from above. You're of this world, I'm not of this world. Therefore I said to you, you're going to die in your sins. For if you don't believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Look at verse 24 again. If you don't believe that I am, and I've, I've told you a hundred times in our King James and New King James, anytime you see a word in italics, it wasn't there in the original language, but in the translation process, they would include the word so it would flow in English, but they put it in italics so that you would know that's not actually there. This just helps the sentence read better in English. So what he said was, if you don't believe that I am, same title, same name for God that Moses heard at the burning bush, ego emi, I am. Jesus just said, if you don't believe that I am God, you're going to die in your sins. They understood what he meant. In the back of your handout, letter D, the prideful religious leaders thought Jesus was going to kill himself and be condemned because he mentioned going somewhere they couldn't come. Only those who know who Jesus Christ really is, the great I am, can go to glory with him. If you don't believe that I am, you will die in your sins. I am. Wonderful name. God revealed different names for himself throughout the Old Testament based on what he might have been showing about his attributes at the time. And so as Moses asked this question, you know, there's a bunch of gods in Egypt. Who shall I say sent me, Mr. Pharaoh? Tell them I am, that I am. 
Now, when you ask somebody about themselves, they start off by saying, well, I was born at such and such a time, and this time next year I will be a certain age. Well, God doesn't use that terminology. Because why you and I have to start off by saying, I was, he said, no, no, I am. <laughs> a billion years from now, I am. So you, you look at your high school yearbook, your smile may be the same, <clears throat> but there's been some change. <laughs> God doesn't change. <clears throat> okay. Always was, always will be unchangeable, I am that I am. Yahweh, Jehovah, I am. Jesus kept using the same name. That's why these Jewish men are getting outraged. They knew exactly what he was saying about himself. You're from beneath. I'm from above. You're out of this world. I'm not from this world. You're going to die in your sins unless you believe that I am. He's getting their attention. That's why you see verse 25. <laughs> Who are you? Yeah. Who are you? Aren't you Joseph's son, the carpenter? Aren't you Mary's boy? You? Who, who are you? Talking like this. Just what I've been saying to you from the beginning. I have many things to say. To say and to judge concerning you, but he who sent me is true, and I speak to the world these things which I heard from him. Verse 27, they did not understand that he spoke to them of the Father. Then Jesus said to them, when you lift up the Son of Man, you will know that I am. Catch that? He is in italics. When you've lifted me up, and it's the term for lifting up on the cross to be crucified, when I am crucified... Then you will know that I am, that I do nothing of myself, but as my father taught me, I speak these things. You, you see in his humanity, he's saying nothing other than what the father is saying through him. He's still the son of God, but he's living in his humanity so he can put his perfect life onto your account as a substitute for your sinful life. In perfect Harmony with the Father. Verse 29, he who sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone. I always do those things that please him. As he spoke these words, many believed in him. When you lift up the Son of Man, you will know that I am. Most of what Jesus said about his relationship with the Father went over the heads of the original listening audience and is misunderstood by those who read his words today. It would take the death of Christ, the lifting up of him on the cross, to cause many to believe. Last section. True freedom comes from the correct belief about the person and work of the Christ. As he spoke these words, many believed in him, and then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, we're Abraham's descendants. We've never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? Jesus answered them, most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. A slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. The text says some some people started to believe in him, and then he starts to challenge those who believe and say, you got to continue in my word. See, some people believe what Jesus was saying about himself and about salvation. Well, well, others were believing a little differently. That's what's going on in these verses. Some some believe, okay, he may be our political Messiah. They're, They're believing to that extent, but they're not believing the whole truth. They haven't really believed that he is the I am. And so he's challenging his audience further. You you got to continue in my word if you're really going to be my disciple. And if you continue in my word, then you're truly my disciple. And then the son can really set you free. 
lifelong learners, disciples, lifelong learners, lifelong followers of Christ. Those are the ones who actually experience freedom from sin. Many who think they're free are actually in bondage to sin. you got unsafe friends out here doing anything and everything they think they're grown enough to do. And they think they're living in freedom. And Jesus is saying that person who thinks they're free to do what they want to do, they are actually a slave of sin. Believers, when you look back on your own life and the things you were doing when you thought you were free, now you realize I was in bondage to sin. Because it was my sin, I wasn't calling it what it was. Didn't realize I was trapped. I like to use a lot of airplane illustrations. And, and, and you're in the plane, and you know, the pilot says you're free to move around the cabin. You, people just do what they want to do. But you really have no control about how that plane flies, where it flies, the speed, and where it's going to land. That's not under your control. You're free to move about the cabin. But someone with more authority than you actually has control of that destination. So there's folks out here thinking, I'm free. I can do what I want. And God is saying, "Mm mm-hmm. You're one day closer to somewhere you don't want to be. But those who continue in my word are free indeed. If you're committing sin habitually, you are a slave to sin, whether you want to believe it or not. Slaves don't abide in the house forever. The son inherits. He said, we're Abraham's descendants. We've never been in bondage to anybody. Now, since they were at that very moment enslaved to the Roman Empire, I I hope they weren't that clueless. (laughs) So so, so maybe they were saying, okay, we've never been enslaved by anybody else's religious beliefs. We believe what Father Abraham taught. I'm trying my best to give them some credit, but I'm struggling. Verse 37, Jesus said, I know you're Abraham's descendants, but you're trying to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak what I've seen with my father, and you do what you've seen with your father. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham, but now you seek to kill me. A man who's told you the truth which I heard from God. Abraham didn't do this. You do the deeds of your father. They're going to clap back again. Uh-oh. <laughs> they said to him, um, <clears throat> verse 30, I'm sorry, verse 41, we weren't born of fornication. We have one father, God. You catch that? Yeah. All right, Jesus, you, you keep talking about your father. Uh, it was your mother who fornicated with somebody to give birth to you. We, we weren't born like this. You're the one. God is so gracious. You'd know you'd have jack slapped somebody again by right there, wouldn't you? And he's actually letting them have this conversation and trying his best to show them that he's the light, but he's trying to tell them Satan is your father. See, truth be told, God is everyone's creator, but you really don't identify him as your father until you're born again to his family by the Holy Spirit when you've acknowledged the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus said to them, verse 42, if God were your father, you'd love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God, nor have I come of myself. He sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? You're not able to listen to my word. Now he gets 100% right in their face with this one. In case they missed it before, verse 44, you are of your father the devil. And the desires of your father you want to do. 
He was a murderer from the beginning, does not stand in the truth, because there's no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources. He's a liar, the father of it. But because I tell you the truth, you don't believe me. Which of you convicts me of sin? Point out something I've ever done wrong, he's saying. And if I'm telling the truth, and I tell you the truth, why don't you not believe me? He who is of God hears God's words, therefore, you don't hear because you're not of God. Wow. See, only those persons, letter B, section three, almost done. Only those persons who know the Lord is their father and Jesus Christ is the unique son of the father are genuine believers. All others still have to claim Satan as their father. Question on the floor, who's your daddy? <laughs> Did you notice Jesus said, if, if you don't understand what I'm saying, that means that Satan is your father. Believer, when, when you're having a, a witnessing conversation with someone and you, you make a couple of biblical statements and they come out of left field, so would you just step back and say, okay, this person is still spiritually dead. And they're not going to understand what I say until the Holy Spirit gives them light and gives them life. Don't argue for two hours. Take it from somebody who used to (laughs) do that. I would go toe-to-toe. You're not going to take my book that God gave me, his love letter to me, and tell me what it says, and I know you're wrong. This may not have been on my schedule, but it's on my schedule now. We're going to have a Bible argument. (laughs) And the Holy Spirit had to convict me, Ron, you're not trying to win their soul. You're trying to win the argument. Not going to be effective like that. Stop the arguments. Okay, this person is unsaved. They're still in darkness. I need to just go pray that God gives them light because they're not going to understand this. Until they repent and the Spirit of God gives them light, now we can have Bible study. Because you can understand the words of Jesus. You're not going to, why would you argue about colors to someone who can't see? You see it's orange, they're saying it's blue. Until they can see, you can talk till you die. They need to be able to see the same thing you're looking at. And only the Holy Spirit gives you that ability. Let's wrap this up. Only those who know the Lord are able to recognize his words as the word of God. The the unsaved cannot tell the difference between God's word and doctrines of demons. You look at what they said to him in verse 48. After this beautiful explanation of, fellas, you're... You're doing Satan's work. You can't understand my words because you're not a God. They come back at him in verse 48. And then the Jews answered and said to him, didn't we say rightly that you're a Samaritan and have a demon? The greatest insult they could call someone ethnically was to call them a Samaritan. Mixed breed, mixed religion, social outcast. You're a Samaritan and we believe you're demonized. They're talking to God incarnate. You you see what Satan can do when he has somebody wrapped up? He's got the demon speaking through them, telling God that he got a demon. And they think they're right. God, you're demonized. Really? As one guy used to say, why y'all why y'all still working for Satan and his wages have never changed. The wages of sin have always been and always will be death. You haven't gotten a raise in all these years and you're still, you're still working for him. Verse 48, Jesus said, I don't have a demon. I honor my father. You dishonor me. I don't seek my own glory. There's one who seeks and judges. Most assuredly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. The Jews said to him, now we know you have a demon. (laughs) 
Abraham's dead, the prophets are dead, and you say, if anyone keeps my words, he shall never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham, mm. who's dead? The prophets are dead. Who are you making yourself out to be? Who do you think you are to say that if you keep my words, you'll never die? Jesus answered, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It's my father who honors me, of whom you say he's your God. But you've not known him. I know him. And if I say I don't know him, I'd be a liar like you are. <laughs> I know him. I keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad. He, see, Jesus did acknowledge that physically you're descendants of Abraham, but let's talk about Abraham for a while. He, he rejoiced to see my day. Hmm. You say anybody who keeps your word will never die. And they receive the gift of eternal life. The unbelievers can't comprehend that. Last, last letter on your handout. Don't, don't miss this. Jesus just said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it. And he was glad. The Bible says Abraham had the gospel preached to him. He had encounters with the Lord. In Genesis, you, you see this supernatural manifestation of the, the angel of God, the messenger of God. That, that was Christ. You remember he appeared and had dinner with Abraham, and he had two of his angels with him, and he's talking to Abraham and Sarah, and he's telling them about the birth of, of Isaac. Christ had appeared to Abraham. Abraham had the gospel preached to him when he was about to kill his beloved son Isaac, and, and God stopped him and, and provided a substitute but Abraham went on that mountain believing that if he killed his son, whom God had made a promise through, that God was going to have to raise him from the dead. And he'd never seen a resurrection. He had that kind of faith. And that's the gospel story, that the father was going to sacrifice his son and then bring him back to life. And Jesus was saying, Abraham rejoiced to, to see my day. He saw it and he was glad. And they missed it again. In verse 57, they said to him, you're, you're not even 50 years old. What are you talking about having seen Abraham? Abraham lived hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago. Jesus is physically in his 30s. And they're saying, as young, there is no way that you've seen Abraham. I mean, you might look old, but you're not that old. You, <laughs> and then he hit them right between the eyes again. He said to them in verse 58, Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, and he says it here again, I am. Before Abraham ever came into being, I am. This time, they knew exactly what he said. And that's why you get verse 59. They picked up stones. They didn't care what the Romans said. They were so outraged that this man just stood in front of their face and declared that he was God, that they were going to kill him on the spot because they thought he committed blasphemy. They wanted to kill Jesus for declaring that he was God. Wow. The thing they needed to believe in order to be saved, they wanted to kill him for because he revealed it. That's what happens when you're living in darkness yes. instead of in the light. Jesus hid himself, went out of the temple. Remember, there's a mob of people. He just... Slipped through the crowd because it wasn't his time to die. They were standing in the midst of the light of life 
Instead of letting that light guide them, they were being blinded by it. The light has come and is shining in all of his glory. Are you seeing more clearly? Or have you just gotten used to living in the dark? Father, thank you for showing us again who you are. Thank you for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the light of the world, the light of life, the light that has called so many of us out of darkness. It's my prayer, Lord, that anyone under the sound of my voice who has been blinded by the light instead of being guided by it would respond to your spirit today and make that eternal life-changing decision, that destination-changing decision to acknowledge you as the great I am. King of kings, Lord of lords, and receive your gift of eternal life. Father, we're so grateful to realize that even though you caught us in our sin, you were willing to forgive us and deliver us from it. Father, even when we were insulting you and we should have been worshiping you, you gave us time and space to repent. We thank you and praise you again for that. Lord, as you said to the woman to stop practicing that sin, it's my prayer, Lord, that all of us would uh, learn to walk in holiness and be delivered from the sinful habits and practices that have so easily beset us. We're amazed by your grace and your mercy. We're so grateful, Lord, that you have shined your light into our darkened hearts and that now we've received the light of life and the gift of life. It's our prayer, Lord, that everyone who's in this room today would one day be before your throne. Pray that you would bring that to pass. For your glory we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.